Welcome everyone to this session uh, of CYBOS, where we'll be talking about scalability of artificial intelligence. So as you know, during the last decade, the adoption of AI has greatly increased and it's pretty much used everywhere. So for example, you know, on Zoom, you'd have you no know, automatic caption that use natural language processing. Uh, on your computer or your mobile phone, your, your spam uh, engine basically also uses you no know, artificial intelligence. So it's being used you know, everywhere. And it's really at the core of the business of the dominant players in the industry, like Google and Alibaba, for example. But what about the finance industry? So you might not know it, but actually the finance industry, financial services, is one of the largest spenders in artificial intelligence today, even before others like retail or defense, for example. Uh, and if you think of it, you know, of course, it's very obvious. You know, five years ago, when we had to open a bank account, you know, we had to go to a branch and open a bank account. Today, many banks and you know, pretty much you know, all fintechs allow you to scan your passport, use facial recognition, you know, all of that uses artificial intelligence. On a daily basis, we see you know, banks you not know, doing much more in that space. For example, Deutsche Bank signing a partnership with Google to use Google Cloud and machine learning. We see Goldman Sachs, for example, acquiring white ops that uses machine learning to detect bots that try to impersonate humans. So definitely a lot of developments that we see in the space, but is it really transforming the industry yet? Uh, for example, you know, for those of you who works in financial services, sometimes it doesn't really feel like an AI world and uh, where we tend to talk much more about legacy systems. Uh, and even you know, last year during COVID of you know, even using paper. Uh, so how do we scale artificial intelligence? What is required? Uh, we have the chance to have exceptional speakers who will address a lot of different areas from infrastructure to ethics and of course, the people side. So let me do the introductions. First, uh, I will be your moderator for today. I'm uh, the co-founder of CFT and we're a knowledge platform in digital finance where we help financial institutions and people upskill in this fast changing world. I'm calling from London. I was previously a managing director at Citi, associate fellow at Oxford, and also founding partner of Supercharger, the largest fintech accelerator in Asia. With us today, uh, we have three exceptional speakers and I can't go through all their CVs. Uh, it's very, very long, so you can have a look at the LinkedIn for this. First, I'm very happy to welcome Ayesha. So Ayesha Kana is co-founder and CEO of ADO.ai. She's involved in many AI initiatives around the world, such as the World Economic Forum. She's also on the board of IMDA and she founded 21C Girls, which helps girls in Singapore learn about artificial intelligence. I first saw, I don't know if you remember I, uh, Ayesha, but I saw you in 2016, I think in Hong Kong. And I still remember very vividly your presentation when you spoke <laughs> about the role of people in artificial intelligence. Now, uh, after Ayesha, we have David, uh, David Hardun. David is a senior advisor for data and AI at Union Bank of the Philippines. Uh, he also teaches and researches at a, a lot of different universities uh, like SMU, NUS, UCL. And uh, I met him a few years ago when he was a still chief data officer at MAS, the regulator in Singapore, and leading all the work on ethics uh, and AI that led to FIT, uh, the framework around fairness, ethics, accountability, and transparency, which has now been a foundation for many reflections on AI and ethics around the world. And uh, last but not least, very happy to welcome Shamik, uh, Shamik Kundu, who's head of financial services at Truera. Uh, he's also a member of the working group for the Bank of England on AI. Uh, and he was previously, uh, we met a few years ago when he was chief data officer of uh, Standard Chartered, where he was working on industrializing the process of implementing AI in a bank from you know, the first discussions to proof of concepts and a real implementation. And the three of them are based in Singapore. Uh, just for the story, uh, a few years ago, uh, two years ago actually, uh, with a CFT and Nian, we embarked on this uh, big project of creating a reference course for artificial intelligence. Uh, and at that time, uh, we worked with dozens of experts around the world. Uh, and I was one of the program directors. Ayesha was one of the senior lecturers talking about uh, the foundations of AI. 
David talked about ethics and Shamik about the role of people. Uh, so we've been talking about those topics for quite a while. Uh, so welcome to the three of you. you. And now let's jump directly into those topics and uh, we have much to talk about. First, we'll talk about scaling uh, because we're talking about the scaling of artificial intelligence. Uh, and first, you know, what do we mean by scaling? And perhaps I'll jump right to you, David. How would you define scaling of AI? Well, I think that's uh, actually a wonderful place to start because uh, different organizations, and again, there's no right or wrong here, but there's different definition from scalability. I mean, if you look at AI ultimately as an innovation function, as a pilot function, a sandbox, could be a scenario that scaling there is how many can you do? In another situation whereby, for example, like myself, very much focusing on operationalization of AI, which means is pushing into production, Scalar B could be a case of how widely you can actually start uh, adopting it within the organization. How, to what extent are you able to incorporate it in an enterprise from an execution perspective? So it, it's a non-trivial and it's a critical matter to upfront be able to identify, well, first and foremost, when we think about scalability, which means how do we start adopting AI more prolifically within an organization? Well, what's our, what's our benchmark? What's our, if I dare use the term, what's our KPI? What is it that we're actually after? And based on that, it is now possible to start going, well, first of all, benchmarking being uh, indexes or other organizations. And then secondly, start identifying what are those uh, tactical steps that are necessary in order to meet that scalability objective. So Shamik or Aisha, would you have the same definition of scaling or different one? Yeah, well, I mean, look, this, the way that artificial intelligence was done before was that somebody would read the cover of Wired magazine and decide that they wanted to be the CEO of a tech company, not a bank. And they would have these little POCs and they were usually headed by some group innovation officer. And after a year, you had these pilots like littered like garbage across the entire institution. Um, and people started realizing that it's not scalable because they were not connected to a data infrastructure. And I think that's the big realization. To achieve scale, you need to rethink your data infrastructure and how it is going to accommodate and be machine learning enabled with streaming data, with processing of unstructured data. And you know, all of us, the way we started off in computer science and software engineering was very different the way you set that up. What I'm noticing now is that a lot of CEOs want to do it right. Of course, as David said, what's the KPI? The KPI is still the business value, but the foundation is set right from the start. The data assets, data pipelines, metadata are repeatable across multiple projects, even if they're pilots, so that they're not done in isolation from each other. And there's a data governance around it so that it doesn't become an unwieldy octopus. The appreciation of this that is a huge change in the three years that I've been working um, you know, as CEO of Addo AI. And I think we're seeing finally a mindset shift in organizations. It's gonna take time, but the key is uh, the data infrastructure more than the models, because that's actually almost easier to do once you have the right infrastructure in place. Thanks, Aisha. And Shemik, from your experience at Standard Chartered, Sure. What do you think of scaling? Well, first of all, I, I, I like the fact that Aisha made me feel good and bad at the same time. I was a <laughs> one point group chief innovation officer, but more importantly, I was chief <laughs> data officer, which did require me to focus exactly on those plumbing and governance and all the relatively boring things that underpin that. So I'm, I'm both happy and sad at the same time. Um, how do I define scalability? I think um, I just say you, you started off with the example of Google or, or Alibaba or anybody else like that. Now imagine, could these companies function without AI? I mean, the answer is a resounding no. And I think that's the point. Unfortunately, most banks still can survive without AI. If you think, of, unfortunately, only from a scalability perspective. So to me, scalability will be when scalable AI is when AI is deployed at a level, at, 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 an, at, at, a, at, at a scale that starts mattering to organizations. So that if it didn't work tomorrow, the bank would have serious repercussions. And I don't think 
most financial institutions have reached that stage. I think they have in specific pockets. So yes, you know, onboarding would get, uh, you know, direct onboarding would be at risk in many organizations if, if uh, the, the image processing didn't work. Some aspects of compliance function would be at risk. Um, certainly some kinds of automated investigation of fraud, financial crime, et cetera. But for the most part, I don't think that particular test, which is, does the CEO lose his sleep, sleep over whether AI is, my AI is working today or not? I don't think we've met that. I think the CEO does lose his sleep on whether somebody else will eat my lunch on the basis of using AI, but not yet at the level of, if my AI didn't work tomorrow, I'll, I'll have trouble. And I think that is the test of scalability. Just to jump in and, and not to belate the, the points, but I think it's even going one step further back in terms of definition of scalability is what's the objective. I mean, and, and, and hearing you know, all the points being made, but I can still call out people who their, their KPI is how many POCs they're doing. And if ultimately that's what they're measured in, we shouldn't be surprised that that's what they're doing. Again, that's what I'm saying. It's not necessarily a bad or wrong or right thing. It is what it is. And that also goes back to the objective in terms of, well, is AI and data science done as a, mm, it's, it's there and if it works, if it's relevant, we then put it and see how to combine it? Or do we say, no, we need to, as, and I would maybe use the colloquial term in Singapore, die, die must work. It has to be part of the business underlying strategy. So that underlying predicate is absolutely critical. And then that goes to a definition of, well, how do we make sure it's scalable within the organization? What is that purpose of the scalability? Yeah, thanks a lot, David. And um, I, I really like your, your definition, Shamik. Uh, and uh, if we take note of that definition, am I right to say that you know, from you know, what I heard from the three of you, it seems like we're still far from financial institutions in general, in terms of scaling. We're really at the beginning. Would you agree or, or not? Yes, I would agree. <laughs> Yeah, so would I. I think that there's a lot more in the media that people claim they're doing. And then you go inside and see that they have neither the infrastructure nor the political mandate nor the talent. Uh, but there is some rumblings in most banks now. And if they get the right people to help map out their journey while providing business value along the way, um, you know, I think they can go a long way. But there are very few banks in our experience, and we also work with banks uh, in Asia and in the Middle East. We don't see them nearly as much as they claim they're doing in public. We, oh, go ahead, Tabi. Uh, I would say, you know, and on the basis of my newfound experience on the other side as a, as a, as a potential vendor to, uh, to banks and insurers on, on how to make their AI trustworthy, I'd say five out of the 20 senior data and AI execs I've spoken to around the world are at a level where they start meeting. So I don't think it's as bad as, you know, 10%, 20%. I think at least a quarter of the banks I've spoken to um, are at a level, but yeah, the vast majority still are not at a stage where AI matters enough for the CEO to lose. Uh, I was just about to add that look, at the end of the day, if you're not talking about AI as DevSecOps, if you're not talking about delivering it as part of almost like a factory and assembly line, if you're not talking about scalability and execution, if you're not measuring your AI in terms of PNL impact, yeah. then no. If you're doing those things, I, I, I would say that that's absolutely the right path that a financial institution needs to take. It less, it's no longer a fancy, it's no longer an innovation kind of uh, uh, allure. It is something which is, basically a heart and the soul of the organization. It's part of what it does. I have to totally agree with that. I think that's, I think, and all three of our, us are making the same point, which is, um, you know, it has to bring value and be done in a way that is basically deployed at scale. It's not a fancy anymore, basically. I like that word. Yeah, that, uh, and I think, you know, when uh, we were talking a few months ago, David, there was a word that kept you know, coming back uh, in your mouth that was operation, operational. <laughs> Operationalization, <laughs> yes. Operationalization. <laughs> yes, no, absolutely. About, you know, the, the scaling and industrialization. We, so, we're at the stage, and again, this is a, totally a personal view that we're talked about AI enough. We, we don't need to talk about it like, oh, is it gonna deliver value? Is it gonna be useful? I mean, if, we, if there's still people at this stage 
do and while and because of COVID that are still not certain of the value associated with digitalization and AI, I, I give up fully. Um, so now the conversation is about operationalization. How do we take it and make this basically the blood of the organization? And so, and so let's talk about this operationalization uh, and, and scaling. Uh, key success factors and challenges. What do you think they would be? Perhaps no, Aisha, do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, I think this, this notion of operationalizing takes into account that the AI, so-called AI team is not three data scientists with PhDs, but has seven different roles in it from data engineer to ML sec ops to data architect. This diverse team sets up a machine learning enabled infrastructure and it includes in it the data lakes, the data warehouses, the metadata management, and then the um, you know, self-serving analytics. And then of course, for the more hardcore machine learning modules that are custom made. That is what, what can be called an intelligent data platform. It is the plumbing on which new systems, new products, new services, they must rest on that foundation. And that um, can be done iteratively. So the nice thing with software engineering is you just don't have to you know, do it all at once. So you can kind of very rapidly go through the process, but it must be reusable. It's really scale is about reusability. And we're seeing that the cloud, the three cloud providers and others that are jumping in are really bringing this to the fore. And many, many banks are adopting them just like the telcos are. Um, you know, that whole idea of on-premises being replaced by hybrid systems, even if there is data localization, people still want to be faster. They want to use things that are pre-made and modules that, um, and they don't want to have to look over hardware. They want to actually create innovative services for their customers. So I think that's really the key for it is that it takes a whole different view of traditional IT like we don't even, somebody was talking to us about process re-engineering and I was telling them we, that maybe I, you know, in New York was doing that with software, but my team, they're data first. It's data, uh, data give, you know, database, um, data driven process engineering, everything comes down to data. And that is why how you save the data, how you process it, how you ingest it. Um, how you ethically use it, everything defines the next phase, which is the AI modeling. Thanks a lot. So uh, just to summarize for you, the key success factors is really the infrastructure, the foundation from a technology standpoint, uh, being data first. Shanmik, what do you think are the key success factors to uh, scale AI? So again, I'll, I'll agree with all of that, not least because I spent seven years trying to build some of that, uh, not necessarily always with success, but with some success, I hope. Um, but I would also add uh, a second element, certainly for established organizations, those that are not digital first or data first organizations, though, those that have existing ways of doing business, which is the vast majority of banks and insurers. Uh, and that is trust. Uh, that is trust within the organization. So a data scientist being able to convince the relationship manager that, yes, you should listen to my neural networks recommendations when selling to your clients. It's um, with your second line model risk management or compliance teams. It's with your auditors, it's with your regulators, and most importantly, it's with your customers, right? If you're unable to win that trust that this newfangled thing called AI is, is going to somehow, particularly if you're talking to people who've been doing this for, the, for a living all their lives, uh, a fraud investigator or a, or a credit analyst, and you say, actually, you know what? Listen to this, don't listen to your gut feel, or well, you better be prepared to have that battle in terms of convincing them and you better be and actually the the challenge here or the bar here should be that actually they shouldn't even think of ai mm -hmm. nobody talks about uh, you know oh, i i i'm making computer enabled decisions today i mean yes of course you make computer enabled what what other decisions do you make although you did refer during the crisis maybe some people did it on paper but generally we don't talk about oh we are using a computer at work yes of course you're using it i think to some extent going to a stage where people are not mentioning AI anymore, and it's just embedded into the way of, way of working, is important. And to get to that, there is a need to focus on the trust element at, at the various levels that I mentioned. Thanks a lot, uh, Shamik. So we added trust also. Um, David, what do you think? 
Oh, I, I, I don't want to repeat points that make us fully agree with everything. So perhaps the only one that can add to it uh, is, uh, and maybe just shall make to your point, it actually needs to be like the next Apple. We, we, none of us thought about what's actually inside the uh, iPhone or the iPad previously. And we tell people, actually, it's using machine learning algorithms within it. People are like, really? But the, the point I did want to make is because in the end of the day, you know, financial institution is a for-profit organization, largely, uh, there needs to be the link to profit. Uh, I'm always surprised of how many times initiatives when it comes to data science and AI or machine learning, whichever form you want to call it, isn't directly linked to a financial estimate and an impact on PL. And that will result in situations whereby you may be doing something which is phenomenally interesting, but has absolutely no impact whatsoever. And that will erode maybe in one, one, maybe one form or another, will erode a bit of a trust or, 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 or latitude of relevance of, okay, let's, let's try it out. So there needs to be that link and it can be done. It takes a bit of a proactive approach, need to think about how do you structure it, but it can be done. So that's another mechanism of measurement that as we progress in maturity, I believe it becomes more critical and more important. And, and so we talk about uh, those you know, key success factors and from your experience, and uh, so you've been you know, uh, working with you no know, very large you know, financial institutions, you no know, even you no know, regulators. And uh, what have you seen as being the main challenges for this to happen? I think that uh, there are two things. One is that because precisely it does not connect to profit, uh, as David pointed out, and that is the driving force, understandably, of any capitalist and private company. Uh, till it is connected to that, it is very difficult for companies to focus on it. So we all get together on panels like this, and we all say rah rah ethics, and then we go back and uh, you know we take it to our stakeholders, and they're like, "Are you crazy?" And then you do it, and the stock market punishes you. Like, you know, what are you thinking? Because when you try to explainable AI or you try to invest in data governance, uh, sometimes it slows things down. It makes them less accurate and, and they don't have the patience for that. That's when the regulator comes in because the regulator does not hold itself accountable to the market, but to its citizens. And I think they have a very important uh, part to play both in kind of nudging companies uh, through uh, you know, publicly uh, signing pledges, but also frankly through fines and ultimately by writing it into law. So right now we are at the stage where there are guidelines. Even if you look at GDPR, which I'm a big fan of in terms of its principles, you know, when it comes to AI ethics or, or it's, it's kind of vague. But on the other hand, it's kind of going in that direction. We're still at the stage where we're grappling with data. And um, once we understand data privacy, data fairness, data bias, then we can go on to the next part, which is ethics specifically in AI. I mean, they're interconnected, but I think the, the thing that most of them are actually writing into the law or finding companies for is still related to data at the moment. And, and I, if I may, I don't think that's necessarily accidental because I think I actually don't like talk of ethical AI or, or data ethics uh, in isolation. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm yet to come across, at least in financial services, an unethical algorithm, which is good for business ultimately, right? I mean, I've, I've seen at least in two of, of Truera's clients recently, they were biased, uh, I mean, very basic gender biased models. In both cases, they were clearly, the reason they were caught quite quickly is they were clearly defining a particular group as low credit worthy when all common sense said, no, that particular protected group is higher credit worthy. I mean, it's quite clear that bad algorithms are also bad for business. So I think to some extent, and going back to the point about linking to PNL, we should stop worrying about ethical AI for its own sake or, or any kind of ethical data even for its own sake. And we should just think what is good for business. An uncontrolled uh, sharing of data without consent is ultimately bad for business. If you get that kind of data, you probably can't trust it. You probably, it is probably outdated because it doesn't have the consent or, or that you will at some point get into trouble with the regulator for a fine, et cetera. So I actually think if we just think about selfish interest, but selfish with the long term for the organization, we'll all make the right decisions. I, and, and I think regulators are providing a, a well needed nudge in that direction to say, do the right thing because it's also good for your business as well as being good for your customers. I, 
I'll, I'll push back a bit on that aspect because I think you it's correct in terms that you don't really have unethical decisions. And also, I'm, I'm not a big fan about the whole discourse about ethical life, but for a different reason, is when you have a kind of a, a balanced uh, um, uh, a trilogy, a certain degree, between the financial institution, the regulator, and is ultimately the, the consumers. And the reason I say that is because when you don't have, let's say, a sufficiently regulated space, and a lot of times people kind of re recoil from regulation. It's like, oh, no, no, that's going to be bad for business. No, I think it puts in place necessary um, um, perimeters that are saying, well, you may perceive this to be good for you, but it is going to have an adverse effect. I mean, if you go back not too long ago when you had red zoning, when basically people were saying, I'm not going to give loans to people this uh, uh, postcode code. That's it was good for business, but it wasn't the right thing. And then again, at the very risk of opening a big uh, Pandora's box, right now because it's unregulated, one can borderline saying that Bitcoin is unethical given everything that's happening in the background. So there's there's a kind of element. So where I think it's important is that there is the proactive stance by financial institutions in realizing that we're not reinventing the wheel. So on that point. I fully agree. It's not about ethical AI or AI ethics, to, to be more specific. It's simply corporate governance and culture. It's whether it's coming out of an AI algorithm or not, you need to do right decisions that you can stand by and you believe are correct. And the reason I use the term belief is because there's always disagreement. There will always be different viewpoints. So at least at the very least, the organization, its corporate governance, its board can say, we believe we're doing the right thing. But then from a regulatory stance, there is an obligation to come and say, this is the safety net that we're putting in place for the citizens, that we believe going there may be okay in other locations, but in our sovereignty, in our jurisdiction, in our operating environment, we do not think it's the right thing to do. Or perhaps not the contrary, we do believe it's the right thing to do. Again, no right or wrong. So it's that, again, not to make too many analogies, but like a holy trinity, which is important in maintaining that balance. Yeah. And I think one of the things that's interesting is the education. For example, uh, you know, for software engineers, the data scientists, or product managers, when in the process do they stop? When does it almost become mandatory for them to stop and say, and question, is this ethical or not? That kind of critical thinking hat that our kids are learning at school, but we kind of forgot the moment we graduated. Um, so Singapore is now coming out with some certification for product managers that uh, will put in certain processes in place. It's pretty much like agile or any other process. You get used to it, you know, the CRISPR framework, anything you may do. Once you embed it in something that's a standard, just asking that question and the right questions um, at the right point in time will make, and you know, people who are engineers and others, they're not traditionally asked these questions uh, and they don't ask them themselves either, but having that space to do it as part of the process will make a huge difference. Because I think people, even though the investors, the stockholders, the CEOs are uh, not always uh, driven by ethics as much as by profit, the, the, the person is, the individual is, and we're seeing that now all over the world, people are beginning to rebel against what they think is the injustice related to some algorithm. Thanks, Ayesha. That, that's a very good point, and uh, we'll come back a bit later uh, when we talk a bit more about trust. Here, I would like to push you a bit more on this part about uh, challenges for you know, large organizations to, uh, to scale AI. Because the reality is that if we think about it, you know, there are some organizations, you know, Chang'an, for example, Chang'an uh, insurance company, digital insurance company in China, uh, 500 million clients, so the most number of clients ar around the world for a company that was created in 2013, AI from you know, end to end, 3,000 employees to serve 500 million clients. So for them, clearly in terms of scalability, they do it you know, extremely well. On the other hand, Stripe, you know, created you know, 10 years ago, now with a market valuation, which is larger than almost any banks you know, in the world. So those tech companies, let's call that you no know, tech first you no know, companies, or you know, let's call that modern companies, won't have any issues to, uh, to use AI. Now the reality is that you know, we have all been you know, in banking or we work you know, with banks, you know, our audience is with banks. And the reality of what we see in AI today is very, very far you know, from this. Uh, so 
I guess, you no, know, perhaps a provocative question is, do you think that banks you know, can make this transition into being AI companies? Uh, and you know, what is really blocking them of being AI first? If, if I just may plug something in, because I think that's a bit of an unfair uh, comparison and I'll explain why. And in fact, opens the door to something that I strongly believe in is you're talking about a lot of tech companies that operated in effectively a completely unregulated space, um, which isn't the reality. I mean, one can argue that the financial space is one of, if not the most, the most regulated. And that will result a natural um, uh, necessity to make sure that you don't uh, play, uh, don't fall afoul of the regulator versus situation of oh don't worry if it goes something wrong we'll just fix it overnight. That is fundamentally a very very different mentality. And yes, results in creating extremely successful, extremely large organizations. But you don't know how many mistakes happen along the way. But it also creates big mistakes. Wirecard to call out one out of the many along the way. Now the scenario is. In fact, I, my personal point of view is that we need to have a balanced approach. A balanced approach meaning that financial institutions, and to answer your questions, I do absolutely believe they can make the transition. And they need to realize that while having that governance regulatory approach, that is actually a value proposition that a lot of the big tech companies do not have. But they need to be open for that innovation, be open for that experimentation, be open for flexibility within a risk managed approach. Vis-a-vis -vis the tech companies, is I, I desperately think you need a tech regulator. You need to have an ability of saying, go ahead, go nuts, make amazing stuff. But there needs to be control. There needs to be governance in assuring that innovation is done safely. So I just wanted to kind of balance those two in. I have to agree with David. I think that... I think absolutely they can make this transition. In fact, all of our clients are very large enterprises who've been around for decades who are trying to make this transition. And they have an advantage, not only because they're used to regulation, but because they have been collecting all this information for a long time. Um, they're, they're both technical challenges, just the, the variation of the, the data that they have everywhere, just organizing all of that. And then the cultural, challenges. I think there's a fear of automation and replacement of tasks and just political, the political will is not there. I think if they can overcome that, we see they can very rapidly move towards modernizing their, um, their infrastructure and get to a point where they're really getting the benefits from AI. So I'm pretty optimistic about their capability trans to transform. Thanks. Yeah. I agree with uh, with what you just said, Aisha. I guess I'll I'll, I'll come back to the point about um, you know it, it's in some ways the def what what is the biggest barrier to AI that large banks need to overcome is perhaps to stop talking about AI. I, I don't think really, you know most people don't remember that banks are built on elaborate statistical models in the first place. Every aspect of a bank. Tell me one other industry that is so fundamentally dependent on models. We have always been dependent on models. If there's any other, and maybe insurance, I, that's the other one, right? Underwriting models. So I think if we stop talking about AI and make it less threatening and just focus on the good, good data, well-governed data, I, I do think, Aisha, we might be underestimating the extent to which, oh, sorry, overestimating the extent to which banks have data. I know all my ex mm. say, oh, you have a lot of data. But the reality is you probably do want to open up to non-banking data. Mm. Actually, that is one of the technical jumps that, tech, not technological, but technical jumps that large banks need to do. But other than that, for the most part, yes, everybody knows about legacy tech. Everybody knows about data governance challenges. Those need to be overcome and those are being overcome. Uh, but really overcoming the cultural barrier is to stop talking about AI and just talk about what well, slightly more advanced way of doing your credit models or a different way of doing your credit models, which happens to use a different technique and much more broader data set. Most people will agree with that. Tell them I want to get approval from the MAS or the PRA for a new uh, scorecard, which involves a brand new modeling technique. Not so much, right? So reducing that fear, I think, is quite a significant part. Yeah, I, I, Shamik, I couldn't couldn't agree more. In fact, I strongly believe that one of the biggest mis well, okay, I don't need the word mistake, but uh, challenges that financial institutions do, especially when they walk into a regulator, is basically saying, oh, let me show you what this machine learning algorithm we built and how impressive it is and so forth. And that's kind of usually when I kind of put my head in my hands. 
the conversation should be not about the machine learning. It should be that we simply have a new algorithm and this is how we manage the risk. This is the risk we're exposed to. Right. You know, no need to reinvent the wheel. We have model validation. We have models. We have risk management. We have mismitigation. And that's why I was mentioning earlier that I believe that the governance uh, 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 the, you know, the, the, the governance element as part of the DNA of financial institutions, in fact, is a value proposition that is unbeatable. Yet, because of that trust, if I go back to the point, Jamit, that you're making, making uh, much earlier about AI, it's also that trust to the ultimate customer base that you're providing. And uh, we have 10 minutes left. Uh, so let's jump very quickly on the trust side. Uh, you were talking about trust with consumers, uh, Shamik, a bit earlier. And that reminded me, uh, I know if you know the story, but I'm based in London. And last year we had, the, let's call it the fiasco of uh, the A-levels, where basically they wanted to use some kind of you know, algorithms to uh, create basically the A-levels. Uh, we don't really know what is behind. Uh, I don't think it's you know, very fancy you know, machine learning. Uh, but what was funny was uh, Boris Johnson talking about mutants algorithm that you know, really sounded you no know, scary in terms of you know, what was happening for the A levels of the children. Uh, and, uh, and I think you know, on, on the trust side, uh, perhaps you know, um, David, do you want to talk in just you know, one minute about feet and what it was? And I think that would be a good transition into how do we operationalize you know, these kind of approaches? No, sure. I'll, I'll give a very, uh, very quick plug. And in fact, uh, Shamik was very much part of that process of creating FEED. So FEED, in short, is Fairness, Ethics, Accountability, and Transparency. And when it was introduced, this was back in 2018. And, and I, I have to give that context because now there are, there's a plethora of principles, there's a plethora, plethora of guidelines in terms of healthy organizations, which is a good thing, uh, essentially. But back then, there was a realization that a lot of financial institutions, while there was immense desire and immense willingness to go into this world, of data, data science, and AI, there was a fear of, well, what is the regulator thing? You know, how, how do I make sure I don't fall afoul? Because there was effectively a vacuum to a certain extent in terms of what is permissible, what is not permissible. So FEAT essentially was an attempt to keep things simple. It's, it's 15 principles, if I remember correctly, uh, to create a guardrail of saying, these are underlying guidelines, these are principles in terms of how an organization should go about in developing and more importantly, operationalizing their AI and machine learning within the concepts of fairness, accountability, transparency, and ethics within the internal of the organization and external. And I just will mention two particular important, well, three important points. One is when you read it, you actually don't even realize that it's applicable to financial set to the financial sector. It's essentially, it's, 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 it's wholesale, <laughs> good principle that one should have when going about developing uh, and operationalizing uh, AI. I mean, like I said, to me, it's more like a hygiene. Secondly, and that was to me, one of the realizations that came out of it is a lot of those governance, a lot of those councils, a lot of those reviews were already in place. These are things that we were doing. We just didn't think about the fact that we were doing it. And it was how to go about essentially and replicate it or overlay it on those newly uh, enhanced models or new models. And then finally, truly to identify and to example of the, uh, what was it, mutant algorithms, that there is a necessity in certain situations to think about where it is different. And, and if I use again that as an example is where it is different is the appeals process. There was a need to think of how do you go about in appealing a decision which was effectively a data-driven and algorithmic decision. Now, again, I'm not here to say right or wrong and how it should be done or how it should not be done, but it was that highlight that you kind of need to think about it. And if you don't think about it, that's when you have what, what I call those oops moments. So that was the intention is to create a guide. I actually believe that we don't actually need feet anymore. We, we've kind of reached the stage when we got to that maturity with the guide. In fact, I believe we need to go to the next level. We kind of need regulation already because we kind of also know what should be regulated and what should be left alone. Mm. Thanks a lot. No, that was, uh, that was uh, really, really uh, insightful. Uh, so Ayesha, I know you've been you know, working a lot you know, on this you know, also. What's the answer for you in terms of trust in AI? You know, I think that for me, and I'm writing a book on this, the, the main thing with artificial intelligence, when you have institutions or governments, be they banks or whatever, Facebook, is the question of human agency. 
And this appeals process is an example of human agency where you can go in and push back against structure such as institutions, such as AI algorithms. And every time I go and give a talk anywhere, I have a lot of people who come to me afterwards and say, we understand the trends, we understand the charts, but what about me? Like, how, what am I supposed to do? I don't understand that. What should I read? What will happen to my job? Uh, if I get refused a mortgage, who can I go to? And that is the question that is ultimately going to force all companies, kind of like what we're seeing happening with climate change, is when the people arise through their own AI activism, as I call it, to impose their agency on the use of AI when it significantly affects their life. And when we educate them on how to critically evaluate that AI and what are the means, judicial means by which to appeal them and others, that is, I think, the linchpin between living in a world of AI where just a few are very wealthy and enjoying the benefits of it and the others are passively being affected by it to a world where it is ethical and just, where we all participate in a way and accept and opt into these things. So for me, uh, you know, all of this boils down to that issue of human agency. Trust and explainability is one thing, but really what are you gonna do about it is also very important. And I think that's where um, explainability, and I'm sure Shamik is gonna talk about that, is very important because people don't understand it at all. Oh, thanks a lot, you know, Aisha. And uh, I guess you know, that's a, a great you know, segue into uh, Shamik. And I also wanted to ask you the question of Shamik, why did you move from a CDO of Standard Chartered into a true era, a startup uh, specialized in explainability? It almost feels like a glide path from David to Aisha. <laughs> How it happened? I started off with David writing, uh, co-authoring co the regulations, uh, sorry, the guidelines that, um, that David mentioned. By the way, David, we dropped the 15th one. It was, thou shall be legal, which we dropped. Uh, so it was only 14 in the end. Um, but it started with that, principles, guidelines, internal guardrails. Then it moved to what you were talking about, Aisha. We did um, education sessions in the end with 500 people, um, most of them MDs and above, but quite a few of them data scientists, technologists, et cetera, on, on our first experiment with explainable and well-governed AI. And it was, I mean, there were compliance management teams, there were CEOs of countries, et cetera, and, and lots of data scientists on the ground. And education and, and kind of awakening the human and asking them to challenge whether they are in the process of building the models or, or being affected by them was a big role, uh, was, was a big part of that. But then at some stage, I realized while both of those are essential, they're not sufficient because ultimately, a bit like you know, DevOps or SecOps or anything else which needs to be operationalized, to go back to David's word, you need tooling and automation that embeds in it. And so you might say somewhat self-servingly for a California-based startup, um, software is the solution to software's ills, right? So in many ways, you do need technology that will help those humans who are accountable for that technology look at that reliably and say, what's happening inside? How, what is determining whether this person is getting an insurance, uh, uh, you know, or, or getting their insurance or not, or getting the loan or not? How do I ensure that, that, that this model is not going to break as soon as the data moves this way or that way? Can I stare at this particular uh, piece of um, outcome from the model and say, yes, I can stand by that as a human. And David had a principle called justifiability, which is, it doesn't matter what the machine says, can you as a human defend it, justify it? Uh, and then quite importantly, as a special case of that justifiability, if there is a particular bias, for example, if women are appearing to be uh, better drivers or safer drivers in Europe? Is that something that we can stand by or actually know, even though it seems like the data is suggesting that we have to correct for it? And I think my proposition, my reason for that is regulatory guardrails, internal or external, people, education, awareness within the kind of the human agency to be complemented by the third pillar, which is technology and tooling to help embed these practices as a standard way of doing any kind of model development, uh, uh, you know, reviews and, and rollouts. Thanks a lot. And, and from listening to you, it seems like from the last few years, we've progressed a lot uh, in thinking about you know, ethics and uh, AI. Well, a, a few years ago was a lot of thinking and trying to understand what were the different frameworks. And now it's much more the, the level of you know, how do we make it happen? 
uh, at scale, which is quite interesting. Uh, I see we have five minutes left. I'd like to jump uh, into the people uh, discussion. And, uh, and, uh, and you mentioned it, Ayesha, you said, the main question is, you know, and what about me you know, as a person, uh, which I think is the main one. And when we talk about financial services, of course, you know, there's this big, I would say, you no know, fear of you know, machines you know, replacing people. Uh, I think that we see it you know, every day. Uh, what's your answer to this? What do you think of this? Well, the risk of automation is there. Uh, you know, we can say it's automating certain tasks, and it is doing that. For those people who are uh, willing to take that automation and, and you know, learn and upskill themselves and try to have uh, create more value creation in the company by partnering with AI, by using the output of AI algorithms or by using AI to create new services, their careers are in, in no jeopardy at all. It is for those who resist it. And unfortunately, that's usually those above a certain age group now, it's very difficult for them to get a grip on it that, because they are not tech natives or digital natives and they, they need some way to get them over the hump. So in Singapore, what IMDA has done is that they have said, you know what, you're going to have an internship or you're going to learn and the government will pay you X percent of your salary. So don't worry about it. You know, just go and learn and you'll still get paid. And that's very important. Uh, when it comes to kids, it's different. We can start teaching them uh, from school and college, but for that middle age group, we need to help them give them a support system. And I think what we really need is, we need it to be mandatory, that computational thinking needs to be mandatory, like reading and writing and doing math. And uh, we must include both boys and girls in it. What we have seen is that you don't need to become a data scientist, but you will certainly need to work with one at some stage in your life. And the ability to communicate with each other requires both the data or AI engineer and the business person to learn a little bit about each other. And that has traditionally not been the case. We have not bothered to learn about technology as much as one should, whereas the techies have always kind of scrambled around trying to learn about business. Now, I think that they should meet together because without that communication, that's where 90% of our client projects fail. When the business and the tech or the AI engineers cannot communicate because they refuse to learn about each other, just that basic stuff that's necessary to appreciate and to think expansively and out of the box. Thanks a lot, Aisha. And David, what do you think, you know, how can people not be left behind in an AI world especially if they're not technical? Well, so, so first and foremost, I think the, the principle and the philosophy of leave no one behind is critical. And, and just like we're all using Zoom and we're not really thinking about it, even though for some it's been a complete change, we all use Word and we don't think about it. Like Shamik mentioned, you don't say I, I'm doing my work on the laptop. It, it's just part and parcel. That needs to be the guiding principle and we need to reverse engineer it. But I also want to mention about the jobs because and maybe I feel somewhat responsible to it. I, I always got accused by my best friend that I'm going to be the reason Terminator 2 be wandering the earth. Um, that it's, 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 we actually, I'm an empirical person and we commissioned about, uh, I think it's about two years ago now, and it was an IBF, Institution of, uh, Institute of uh, Banking and Financial Professionals, an MAS, a study. And I said, look, if AI and data science is really going to go out there and destroy all these jobs, there needs to be empirical evidence of it. We need to be able to see it. So we actually conducted that study and the objective was to really understand what's gonna happen. And guess what happened? While yes, there will be some tasks that will be displaced by automation more, more specifically in AI. What you find that fundamentally the jobs don't go away. Their task that constitutes the jobs would change. And this is a freely available report out there which covers over 170 different jobs in the financial sector going down to task level and the imp imp implications and the impact that automation as well, as well as data science, you know, AI was gonna have in it. And to Aisha's point is, what is that uh, uh, progression and career path that one should take? And I think that's really, really important. And then just finally to add is nonetheless, I do not take the fears and concerns lightly. I take them absolutely seriously and organizations need to take them seriously. I've heard many times from C-suite saying, 
But I don't understand why are people worried? Why are people afraid? Put aside the so-called irrationality. It's real. It's there. And that requires a proactive approach to addressing it and showing that the goal is not to have you without a job. The goal is to progress the organization, enable it with new tools and new capabilities, and also enable you with new tools and new capabilities and new knowledge. Thanks a lot. Yes, Vinny. And maybe just to very quick, I, I won't add to what David and Aisha have said because I agree with all of that. But I do think there's one other angle that's missing, and this is not for uh, financial services alone, it's across the board. There's a very good book called Hand, Head, Heart by uh, David Goodart, which talks about valuing the professions that are not necessarily valued. And I think one piece of language, going back to stop, stopping all this talk about AI, almost paradoxically, by talking all the time about the power of AI and digitalization, we scare people. The reality is you do need many, many other roles. In all the, uh, yes, they have to be AI enabled. Yes, they have to learn how to work with the data scientists. But I think, I think we need to shift the conversation a bit also so that we don't stress out everybody who's not building a model or writing code to say, well, actually, if you're not doing one of those things, you don't have a career. No, actually, there's a lot, even in financial services, even in a digitalized world, that does require other aspects. And frankly, it's up to us as a society and as an industry to value those pieces, because without that, we are at risk of kind of destroying the, 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 the golden goose, uh, the goose that lays the golden eggs. Thanks a lot. So we're reaching the end uh, of this session. One minute for a very quick question. So five seconds, no kind of answers from uh, all of you. And uh, I'll start with you, Ayesha. One example of a very interesting AI initiative anywhere in the world. I think some of the very, because we're beginning to work with in healthcare and farmers, I'm very impressed by companies like Bioformat, which are using artificial intelligence and the data from sensors, et cetera, to reduce uh, and intervene at the right time. So patients who've had heart attacks don't end up in the hospital again. I think some of the most exciting uh, you know, applications of AI will actually be in healthcare. And that means a lot to me. Thanks a lot. David? Oh, uh, and I'll take a leaf of Shamik's book, uh, of, of, from Shamik in terms of uh, we need to value cement. Applying AI to predict the compressive strength of cement 28 in advance. So all this buildings that we're sitting in and we don't even think about it, there's a whole process. And if that can be enabled with, and we'll not call it AI, just through processes, through capabilities, with a very, very, very traditional uh, um, operation. I mean, let's talk about finance, talk about cement manufacturing, then absolutely. And not only supporting the organization, being enabled, sustainability and meeting measurable sustainability goals. And I emphasize the word measurable. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, uh, David. Shamik? And I'll cheat a bit. Uh, I'm not sure it's entirely just IT, but um, technologies that help manage all the concerns around data, privacy, portability, sovereignty, and indeed algorithmic transparency, etc. Uh, and some of which also uses AI. I think that's quite important. The only way we're going to get our arms around this problem is if we have robust te technological solutions, for example, around secret computing, et cetera. So I find that area quite fascinating, using technology to protect people from the ill effects of technology. Thanks. And so a very fast, no five second answer. If you had, uh, and I'll start with you, Shamik, if you have 10 million to start any AI project, what would it be? Um, I think it will be about using AI to so, so, um, solve some of the issues around climate, climate change. Thanks, David. Food. Was that five seconds? <laughs> <laughs> Food sustainability. I mean, there are phenomenal solutions out there, but not enough in terms of how to leverage AI to really help in terms of growth, production, sustainability. Food, something that we all kind of need on a day-to-day -day basis. Thanks, Alas. Ayesha? Healthcare. I think what we've seen with DeepMind did with protein folding and what we're seeing with mRNA, potentially vaccines for cancer. This is so exciting. And I would definitely invest in that and, and want to be part of that. Thanks. So I think that's a great way you know, to end this session. So thanks a lot to the three of you. Thanks a lot to the audience you know, for listening to us. It was super insightful. And so, you know, best of luck for everyone in this new AI world. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you.